Lori Mishley. I am a researcher at Bastyr University, and I collaborate with researchers at a couple different clinics. I'm going to talk about three studies that we that I'm excited about. One is ongoing right now, and two are working their way through the ethics board, the IRB, and will be open over the next couple months. So the first study is this CAM Care in PD study. We have a table out back. These postcards are out back. Um, let me just tell you what this is. We started this about seven years ago. There are 2,000 people that we currently are following around the world with Parkinsonism. Any person with any form of Parkinsonism of any age is invited to participate. The more of you who participate, the more we learn. You are the ones with the answers teaching us what's working and what's not. We are asking questions about what you eat, whether you're single, have a partner, whether you take supplements, whether you pray, whether you have a pet. We're looking at hundreds of different variables right now, and we are generating more data than we can keep up with. Um, just to give you a hint at where this line of research is going, is anyone here? Can anyone here guess the number one risk factor for Parkinson's progression that we are finding in our data so far? Uh, people who say that they are lonely are the people who are progressing the fastest. And so not all of the therapies that we are going to come to you with are going to come in a pill or a potion or a procedure. And so what I'm trying to do is expand what it is that we're talking about that can help you. And so some of these things are pharmaceuticals. We are looking at which pharmaceuticals are making people progress faster or slower. If you stop eating cheeseburgers and start eating broccoli, does that change outcomes? So this takes about an hour and a half every six months for you to fill out a couple questions on the questionnaire and then our statisticians write code to tell us what are the variables, the decisions you make each day that are associated with faster and slower progression. So it costs nothing to participate. You don't have to leave your house and takes a total of about three hours per year. The other thing that I love about this is this is completely self-funded. This study is happening because a couple people in the Parkinson's community have donated a little bit of money and Bastyr University medical students have volunteered countless hours to make this happen. This study is a labor of love, not a billion dollar trial. So thank you to those of you who have helped make that happen. The second study I'm really excited about is one that was just funded by Michael J. Fox Foundation. I think back to high school, um, there were all these the popular kids that got all the attention, right? And I think of dopamine as the popular kid that's getting all of the attention. And we need dopamine. I am a huge fan of dopamine replacement strategies. I also wonder if we aren't looking under the wrong lamppost sometimes. And so one of the things I like to do is start looking in other places to get answers. I always found the person who was sitting out on the back porch at the party a little more interesting than perhaps the most popular kid in class. And so what we've been doing is starting to look at urine, look in hair, and one of my most exciting collaborations right now is with University of Washington Department of, of Radiology. Um, as I mentioned with the intranasal glutathione trial, we put people with Parkinson's disease in MRI machines and just using magnetic fields, we can actually tell you biochemically what's happening not only inside of your cells but inside of your mitochondria. And what we think is that people who have muscle weakness and, and which leads to balance issues and falls and things like that are associated with an impairment in your cell's ability to make energy. And so this summer, we are going to be recruiting 30 people with Parkinson's disease to go in the MRI machine, and we are going to measure the capacity of your cells and mitochondria to generate energy appropriately and start to look to see whether or not that might explain the muscle weakness so many of you experience. Anyone who's interested in those, uh, stu that study, stop by the table. We'll be talking to you about what those next steps look like. But for right now, please, please, please put your name in the D Parkinson's disease registry. The Washington State Registry is where we're going to go to recruit patients for that trial. And then the third study that is about to be approved in the next week or so is, uh, how many of you heard about the woman in Scotland who can smell Parkinson's disease? So my research for the last 20 years is basically based on this idea that Parkinson's in part is a metabolic disease with neurological consequences. So when I heard about the woman in, in Scotland who could smell Parkinson's, I thought, well, 
geez, if a woman can smell it, any dog should be able to smell it. And so that morning, I set out to find the perfect dog to train to smell Parkinson's. And it took 18 months to find a breed called Legoto Romagnolo. They're Italian truffle hunting dogs. They've been bred for a 1,000 years to smell ripe truffles underground, communicate with their handler. They're smart. They're small. And um, after eight months of searching for the dream dog, it took four days to teach her to smell the scent of Parkinson's. So um, this summer, what, obviously we can't get dogs in every clinic around the world, so we've been looking at what kind of tool we can use to bring you to us. And so what we have found works best are earwax samples. We have people sending Q-tips with a little bit of earwax on them, and the dogs can tell whether or not you, people smell like Parkinsonism. And so now that we know that the dogs are pretty good at distinguishing Parkinson's from controls, what we want to know is to find out how far does that go. Do they distinguish between MSA, PSP, um, and most importantly, how early can they smell it? So in the next couple weeks, uh, we will start opening the doors and recruiting for the uh, Park 9 Precision Project. So please come talk to us at the table back there if you have any questions. Any, any questions? Is anybody studying the relationship of mycotoxins to Parkinson's? Yeah, great question. Uh, the question is about mycotoxins, toxins that are born from molds. So there is reason to believe that the uh, seborrhea that a lot of people with Parkinson's get is caused by malaysia, is a form of yeast on the skin. And a lot of people are wondering, could that be what the dogs are smelling? It might not, what, what the dogs are smelling may not be what's causing Parkinson's. It could be consequent to Parkinson's. And so that's kind of where the line of questioning has started. And there's reason to believe that that might be in part what the dogs are smelling. Um, but we, uh, I will be presenting at the World Parkinson Congress this summer. We have done, um, we, we're looking for biomarkers that might be associated with Parkinson's, and we have found that the urine of people with Parkinson's disease contains notably more mold mycotoxins, specifically ochratoxin A, than what would be expected in healthy controls. And so I'll be presenting those data this summer at the World Parkinson Congress. Thank you very much. Uh